By the time we get to the reign of Henry VIII, the royal lifestyle has settled down a bit. He is still travelling from palace to palace, but each one now has a dedicated, specialised bedchamber. Unfortunately, I can't show you Henry's bedchamber here at Hampton Court, because it was knocked down and rebuilt in the 18th century. But here's a glimpse into what it might have been like. It's a very sumptuous interior. Here's the king sitting and reading a book. And here we've got a very heavy, ornate, fixed, non-transportable four-poster bed. Considering that Henry had 60 palaces to choose from, it's a shame that none of his Tudor bedrooms survive. Although we can look elsewhere to get a glimpse of the sort of bed he would have slept in. During the summer months, Tudor monarchs were just as mobile as their medieval predecessors, partly for fun and partly to save money by sponging off other people. Maintaining their palaces and the vast retinue of staff and courtiers within was hugely expensive, so Henry would bed hop from one courtier's house to another to alleviate the cost. This is Hever Castle in Kent, in the Tudor period home to the famous Berlin family. We know that Henry visited Hever, and if he stayed over, Thomas Berlin, the head of the house, would have had to give up his bed for his monarch. This bed is a typical Tudor affair, solid oak and decorated all over with intricate carvings. Tudor monarchs could now enjoy a more peaceful night's sleep than their medieval predecessors, but there were still some disruptions. Even royal bed furnishings were often infested with fleas. Henry VIII took a little piece of fur to bed with him so that the bugs would jump onto that rather than suck his own blue blood. Henry didn't feel the need to shut himself away in a castle for safety. But even when he was visiting his courtiers in their houses, he was still quite paranoid about security. Before he arrived, he'd send ahead his locksmiths to install these special portable locks onto the doors. That way, Henry could be sure that only his trusted servants had the key. This is one of Henry's locks. It's really beautiful. And it's got a lovely lever with a funny little Tudor face on it. And the security measures didn't stop here. Before Henry got into his bed at night, his servants rolled across it to check that assassins hadn't concealed a dagger in the straw mattress. As the Tudor period progressed, the future and stability of the monarchy was beginning to shift away from the battlefield into the royal bedroom, because it was here that the long-term success of the dynasty would be decided. Now, at first, the Tudors could be said to have quite a tenuous grasp on the crown, couldn't they? Henry VII, he, he seized it from Richard III. How does he go about building up a stable dynasty? The best way of doing that, of course, was to make a good marriage and then, of course, to have an heir, which is exactly what Henry did. He married soon after his accession and uh, within a very short time, he managed to have an heir, Prince Arthur. So marriage and the birth of children, they're central. Matters of the bedroom are central. Really, we can consider the bed as our kind of theatre or stage upon which all the key events are going to play out. When you read accounts of the wedding of Prince Arthur and Catherine, the Spanish princess, it's almost voyeuristic, the detail. We get to see them going to bed together. You can just imagine sort of Catherine looking at Arthur and Arthur looking at Catherine and thinking... We're for it. We've got to you do know, this We've now. got to get busy. <sighs> and of course, so a massive expectation. And, of course, although everybody would withdraw, you can imagine all the kind of whisperings outside the door, exactly, to know what was going on. And so, of course, when the couple emerged in the morning, there was great expectation. What had happened that wedding night becomes hugely important because within just less than a year, Arthur dies. Catherine of Aragon is left a widow. She's too important a figure to remain unmarried. She is the daughter of Spain. And so what happens? She marries Henry VIII, brother to Prince Arthur. The marriage is happy for a while. Then when no male heir emerges, Henry decides that he wants an annulment. His attention has wandered to Anne Boleyn, and the key issue in order to get that annulment becomes events 30 years before, way back in the bedchamber of Arthur and Catherine of Aragon. The controversy is when Henry wants his divorce from Catherine, he needs to prove that Arthur and Catherine did consummate their marriage, and she needs to prove that they didn't. Yes, I mean, he turns to the text of Leviticus um, where it says that a man shouldn't lie with his brother's widow and suddenly says, aha, this is evidence that I should never have married anyway. And so 
any of those people that were around at the time were called upon to describe what had happened. Um, one of those sources describes how the morning after the wedding, the morning after the night before, when Prince Arthur emerges from the bedchamber, he brags to one of the grooms of the chamber, that, you know, bring me a drink for I'm thirsty because I've spent the night in the midst of Spain, which is a hot region. He could have just been showing off, in my opinion. Bawdy adolescence, perhaps, but who's to say? Catherine remains absolutely committed to the line that she never uh, had sex with Prince Arthur, Therefore, it's absolutely fine and above board for her to have married uh, his brother, Henry VIII. So it's like a little keyhole detail, isn't it? It's such an intimate thing, and yet it's a matter of international diplomacy. Exactly. The marriage bed, which we sort of see as a private space, is the stage, the sort of great public arena, uh, through which these key issues of the Tudor monarchy uh, are played out, really. Catherine of Aragon endured great personal suffering as a result of this investigation into her sex life. But it was also to have extraordinary consequences for the nation as a whole. Gossip from a Tudor bedroom had given Henry the excuse he needed for his divorce, ultimately leading to the break from Rome and the birth of the Church of England. It was clear that a king's performance, or non-performance, in the royal bedroom could now transform the future of the country. The pressure to produce new members of the dynasty became even more intense as the Queen's crown passed to Anne Boleyn. Catching Henry's fancy wasn't enough to ensure Anne's success. She had to produce a male heir. As with Catherine, Anne's fate and the fate of the nation would be decided in the royal bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> 